So as you've heard, Caltech is a very quantum place. This goes back to the start of Caltech in terms of its outlook towards the world. It goes back to the intellectual ventures from trying to understand the fundamental constituents of matter through quarks, bringing together forces through QED and then string theory, trying to understand if we can quantize gravity. Feynman looking at the world around him and asking, can we look at the very smallest scales? Is there room at the bottom for nanotechnology? And as you've heard, its actual expression in terms of the computer revolution, the technology revolution, through Moore's law. Gordon Moore, of course, being one of Caltech's. But if you look more carefully around campus, you can see that quantum mechanics is everywhere. So this is through Paul, or the original freezes from through Paul at Caltech. But if you look really careful, you can see it's Einstein is there. He is part of our architecture. It is not just his spirit, his visits in the 20s, but he has become part of Caltech. Or if you look in a different part of campus, yes, it's Richard Feynman. If you look again across a different part of Caltech, it's Stephen Hawking, much happier in this picture. <laughs> and of course, there's Schrodinger's cat, half alive, half dead, all at the same time, whether you look at it or not. But it's not just the architecture around Caltech, it's tonight, it's our speakers. So we have tonight um, a genial host who knew that he could sing so well. But at the same time, it's a quantum guru. Genial host, quantum guru. The same together. We see a breakthrough philanthropist or a physics phenom. Breakthrough philanthropist, physics phenom, together in one. And we've seen those elements enriching this evening. So how do we harness the power of superposition and entanglement? Well, you've seen quantum chess, which was developed here at Caltech. And in fact, Paul Rudd will be receiving a degree for his mastery <laughs> of quantum computation. Um, but perhaps more realistically, quantum computation and qubits, and since I'm now the third physicist to talk about this, this is the summary uh, before the quiz that you will receive on your way out. <laughs> um, so let me give you an example of the kind of thing you might want to calculate, um, is to look at a computer and figure out how you make the connections. You realize on a modern IC chip integrated circuit, there are billions of transistors. There are as many transistors as there are people in the, United, in the world. And it is a galling and delicate problem to figure out how you would wire this in a way that's most efficient, uses less energy, does a certain sort of calculation. So how would you go around this kind of computation? And here we go to Feynman's work imagining what a quantum computer could be. So you pose a question, and you have your bits. And these are generally classical bits to start with, ones or zeros. Let me know quickly these are all ones. And you now mix them together. So you superpose them first, so they're in both states at once. And now, to do the calculation, you have to entangle them quantum mechanically. You have to ask, not what is one wiring scheme, but what are all possible wiring schemes, and how do you do them together instead of in serial? And then you ask, you get the answer in classical form. This is the schematic that Feynman mapped out, and you know where you are. <laughs> okay, now, now people are great, and I'm a big fan of the speakers tonight, clearly. Um, but they probably, in practice, will not make very good qubits. Uh, but there are a lot of approaches, as you've seen, and you've heard from Dave Weinland about the uh, 
trapped atoms work on this campus as well in terms of IQIM, in terms of thinking about encoding information in atoms and entangling them. There are uh, supercomputing, uh, superconducting uh, elements in computers. Uh, this is a D-wave device that's based on Joseph's injunctions. And there are a lot of promise in terms of topological matter and that you heard from Krista in terms of the work at Microsoft and the work here at Caltech as well. And I think in the next five or 10 years, we are actually going to see the hardware, which then combined with the software, will start to give us insights into what quantum computers can do. As you've heard, code breaking is one. I've certainly been convinced after the talks this evening to take all my money and stick in the mattress because it's certainly not going to be safe in the bank with uh, quantum computers breaking the codes unless I get my cue card very quickly. Uh, but the most interesting part is that only through a fundamentally quantum mechanical device do we have a hope of really simulating a fundamentally quantum mechanical world. And there are all kinds of questions you can pose. Can you simulate the structure of a black hole? Can you design smarter materials, lighter and stronger materials that will help us go into space? Can you design superconducting materials that will allow us to travel faster or transmit power better? You've heard about that in the previous talks as well. Can we use this for biology and protein folding, as you saw the example there, or confirmations of various sorts of catalysts? Can we decipher genetic pathways important for human health? These are all the kind of questions that inspire us, that allow us to think deeply about the fundamental nature of matter, the fundamental nature of our universe, so that we can harness the power of quantum mechanics to push humanity forward. And with luck, we will get there with diligence and with hard work. We thank you all for your participation uh, in this great event. Uh, but I will turn to the last word to whom else but Richard Feynman. Now, I must say that in this age, people are experiencing a delight, a tremendous the light, the delight that you get when you guess how nature will work in a new situation never seen before. From experiments and information in a certain range, you can guess what's going to happen in a region where no one has ever explored before. It's a little different than regular exploration. There is, there's enough clues on the land discovered to guess what the land is going to look like that hasn't been discovered. And these guesses, incidentally, are often very different than what you've already seen. It takes a lot of thought. What is it about nature that lets this happen, that is possible to guess from one part what the rest is going to do? That's an unscientific question. What is it about nature? I don't know how to answer it. And I'm going to give, therefore, an unscientific answer. I think it is because nature has a simplicity and, therefore, a great beauty. Thank you very much.